and uh, he made all those, and it came out really great. We just heard those uh, a couple weeks ago for the first time. Dude, the backups and screams are crazy. Next. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've been listening to the. Is it up a little louder or something? Yeah. Nice. So, if you have a system with subs, you're actually going to hear just this super low sub bass come in, just mm, and it'll just rattle your speakers, and I think that's something that you know hard rock, heavy metal bands and songs haven't really done. <laughs> We're in Vegas a lot. And, and I like to gamble, I love to gamble. That's a good time. I was like, you know, like chromatic scale when you pull it on a slot machine. Da -da 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 I was like, that, that'd be that'd be pretty fucking sick as a riff. Zachy came back with a full-on chromatic scale. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. you know, he took the idea and it was awesome. He sent us this, this demo of it. I'm like, yeah, it's, that's that's perfect. That's really cool. Brian went home and he came up with the da -da 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 -da, kind of added a little more groove to it. He's always been a really big fan of those type of like grooving, like bending, huge guitars. He just loves that stuff. And he loves it when it's a little bit out of tune and a little bit, you know, wavering a little bit so it's not too pretty sounding. The guitar solo, I was, we were actually lifting weights, working out, and I was like, dude, you know what would be cool in the beginning of the record would be just be if you just shredded over something and you didn't even really, it really didn't even have any notes. You're just doing a motif of like a over and over and over. And the solo is the hardest solo to play because it's all picked. It may sound like it's something else, but it's all picked. It's all those fast, ridiculous triplets, and I don't know how I'm going to play it live. But we'll figure it out. That's a badass solo. It's a song that you could definitely bang your head to, or you can always see one of your favorite dancing girls dancing to it. To me, this song with the wrist and stuff was just like a strip club anthem, you know, just pure groove. Girls can dance to it. At the end of that song, we kind of make, wanted to make it like kind of coming in and out and a little bit more of like a euphoric type of feeling. So me and uh, our engineer Fred sat up really late one Saturday night and we uh, started messing around with samples and with delays and reverbs and different sorts of things. And we sat there and just took all my vocals and took them apart and let them go through it. I like the way it goes, it like blends into the chorus. That's so the well. craziest, yeah. So, so that's what Scream came about. We didn't want it to be like, oh, here's a grooving part and we're going to ruin it with a fast part. Kept the whole thing grooving, the whole thing's the same tempo and it just always makes you bop your head. You'll never hear a part in that song where you don't you just want to go like this. Afterlife is a really interesting song. It's just a really adventurous song, probably one of the longer tracks on this record. We were all frantically writing, trying to come up with the best stuff, and Jimmy was actually kind of AWOL for a little while, and we were really trying to get him to come in and write and stuff. Just a spoonful of Jimmy helps the whole world go down. He came one day and said, I have a song for you guys. Little did we know, he had this full song that he'd been, you know, hoarded away in his house writing, and we heard it and we just flipped out. He just really stepped up to the plate, and typical The Rev fashion, the chorus is extremely catchy. It has a pop element, but in a more, like, somber tone. Lyric-wise, it's really a cool concept because you can apply it to, you know, your own life and relationships and stuff, but that's not what it's intended for. The actual storyline is about a person that finds himself in the afterlife and they realize they have too much stuff left on Earth to do, and to go back and make it right, you know, they have to escape from their afterlife so they can go back and make amends with the people they love and care about. Imagine if there is a heaven and you're a crappy person in real life and you, and you show up and all of a sudden you're like, oh crap, I was a crappy person. That's kind of the hell of, of dying too early and, and it's kind of just saying, you know, be a better person now. You know, I have family and friends and I don't want to make the same mistake again. And in this instance, it looks like the person's going to get a shot, a second shot. And all of a sudden these laughs come from where the Reb did those. Can you try a track of more like defined laughs like that are uh, not so distorted? started laughing. He was laughing so hard and he wasn't even, nothing was funny. He was just laughing and I was laughing my ass off in the control room just because it just seemed so funny to me that, that he was doing laugh tracks over and over and over. <laughs>
Dude, you're a fucking genius, dude. To throw that in this song is the fucking best thing I've ever heard. Yeah. During the demoing of the song, we had a, a strings on the keyboard that we were playing, and we eventually got to have Mark Mann come in. One of the great things about Avenged Sevenfold, the guys, is that they're brave enough to try new things. They're also confident enough to know that their songs and their musicianship are just so great that they allow someone to come in and, and, and arrange things or add things. And that's a great honor. I mean, it's, it's, it's trust. And uh, that was really cool to work with him. He came in and did all the string parts that we wanted to have an intro and then slam into our traditional Avenged Sevenfold duels. Sin solos out of control. We had uh, the string players and we were playing through the song and it comes to the guitar solo and, and Brian's guitar solo is just blistering. And uh, Miles, the bass player, was just listening on his headphones and he just had to turn around and look at the control room and just with the biggest grin and when that take was done, he just came out with, my God, that's the greatest guitar solo I think I've ever heard. solo in Afterlife was definitely a trek. It wasn't really written before the studio. I try and get as many solos written before I get in the studio as possible. It just creates a better vibe that way. And from what I gathered, the Rev wanted something ridiculously crazy. Uh, on Afterlife, all the guitar work that Finn does on the album is just mind-boggling, you know? Oh, you have the force. And it's a good look for you, too. Fuck! Let's do it again. Do it again? No, it sucked. Just listen. <laughs> <laughs> and even though it doesn't necessarily fit the song, it's at I think it's finest. It's definitely the most shredding solo on the album. It's ridiculous. It was fun to definitely push the boundaries. I've done stuff that I never thought I could ever play. It's uh, definitely a great feat as far as I'm concerned. That's just one of 11 examples of amazing fucking guitar solos. That's how that song came about, and we're really proud of it. I think Rev did an amazing job, and he really came up big on that song, and hell yeah. Hello? Scream one dead. Uh, we're, we're, Fred's fucking with us. <laughs> Some, Fred needs a refresher course. Let's go back to full sale. Oh, uh, Fred didn't like that. Well, all right. Got a little more run-up? Got nope. it now. <laughs> Gunslinger is one of those things where I had this riff, this heavy riff, and my idea for it originally was this heavy grooving song, one, two, da, 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 da. Brian kind of went home with it and was like, hey, I kind of want to use that riff, but I want to use it, I want to use that acoustic guitar on it. That was this great intro that just climaxes without, you know, the typical climaxes of adding instruments or singing heavier or higher. It just kind of goes naturally from it goes from 1 to 10 by implying numbers 2 through 9. That was about as cool as it gets. That's absolutely unreal. It was really cool to have an intro and a whole verse. It's about a minute long at the beginning of the song where it's just the acoustic guitar and M. Shadow's voice. We had this melody over this and it was like, wow, that, that's kind of cool. And then it kind of went into my idea of it, which was the when the, the song explodes into the, the rock part. The thing that I love about that song is that no matter who I've shown that song to, it's always the same reaction. If you play that song to somebody new that's never heard it before, just kind of stand over their shoulder, and when the chorus comes on, look at their arms, and you'll see every little hair on their arms standing up, because it's just that kind of song, which gives you the chills. He had this pre-chorus, and then this chorus, but the pre-chorus was our chorus now. Won't question why so many have died. That whole part was his pre-chorus, and me and the Rev looked at each other, we're like, dude, that can't be a pre-chorus. That's like a chorus, I, I, there's like closure in that. I think it's definitely one of the most touching set of lyrics. You know, that Matt's probably ever wrote, you know, he's really great at writing 
when it comes to people being separated from each other. Still bring me closer.